It's famous for its grizzly bears, its wolves, bison, and its geothermal activity. All of Greater Yellowstone is actually still an active volcano today. The geysers, hot springs, and thermal pools signal the unrest that continues just below the surface. There's a lot of volcanic activity underground beneath the GYE. And so that expresses itself in many different ways at the surface. For many years, scientists believed these pools were devoid of life. But a fantastic alien world exists in the waters of Yellowstone's hotspots. Yellowstone was the first place these were discovered. The thermal pools are filled with clues about the earliest life on Earth, and even life on distant planets. We study modern organisms that represent ancient life, or that give us an idea of where alien life might be able to exist and how it could exist. In 1966, scientists discovered organisms in Yellowstone's boiling hot springs and called them thermophiles. A very famous microbiologist started sampling, started doing standard microbiological tests, but at higher temperatures, and really, really discovered that organisms were living in these hot springs. These thermophiles are thriving in an environment that would be fatal to most other forms of life. Thermal pools in and around Yellowstone are a living laboratory where scientists are even able to research potential life on distant planets. Understanding sort of the distribution of microbial life in extreme environments on our planet gives us an idea of potentially where else they could exist on other planetary bodies. Montana State University's Thermal Biology Institute studies bacteria, archaea, and viruses that hide in the springs and pools. One of the pools they're investigating is Leduc Hot Springs. The field work here, there's a lot of unique safety issues. Stepping into a hot springs would be very dangerous. You can uh, burn yourself very badly. It's so dangerous that we can't show how they actually collect their samples. It's definitely a case of don't try this at home. We are not going in to these hot springs with big shovels and digging up truckfuls of material. We're taking the smallest possible samples that we can to get the analysis that we want to get. Brent is like a bioprospector as he investigates hot spring biology. In the pools, there's a very um, large number of different organisms, so multiple species of bacteria and archaea, and then each of those has probably five or ten viruses that infect those. They can provide clues as to how organisms lived long, long ago and what types of metabolisms they had. The rainbow-like colors seen in many areas come from heat-loving bacteria. So the photosynthetic organisms give you the greens and the bright oranges. Some yellow come from sulfur precipitation caused by the microbes. Some of the orange is minerals. You can get different colored minerals as well. So it's basically microbes and minerals interacting in the hot springs that give you the colors. Brilliant blue in the center comes from clear water reflecting back blue light, just like the sky. The wild, chromatic beauty attracts tourists, but it also draws scientists that believe these extreme thermal conditions might replicate those found on other planets. Dr. Luke McKay is a microbial ecologist and an astrobiologist. I'm looking for organisms with 
what I call early evolved metabolisms, metabolisms that originated long, long ago, shortly after the origin of life. Brent and Luke know that the invisible microbes that they hunt are elusive and diverse. When we show up at a thermal environment, typically the first thing we do is measure the temperature and the pH of the system. Depending on the environment and the type of thermal feature it is, we'll take different types of samples for chemical analysis to understand what types of chemical molecules, what types of chemistry is the hot spring composed of. Because that will determine what types of microbes live in the hot spring. Both bacteria and archaea inhabit the pools in different proportions, and both target viruses. And so, depending on the hot spring and the chemistry of the hot spring, the bacteria or archaea will use different chemistry. And so, if you have one hot spring that supports the metabolism of a lot of different archaea, then you'll have a lot of archaea there. And pretty much anywhere where you're going to have a lot of archaea and bacteria, you're also going to have a lot of viruses and they're going to be in any of the hot springs. These microbes are all part of the tree of life. All life on Earth can be categorized into one of the three domains of life. Those are archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. And bacteria on the tree of life is easily the most diverse of the three domains. Archaea is, is smaller and eukarya is even smaller than that in terms of you know, if you can imagine an actual tree, it would be like most of the branches are taken up by bacteria. It's crazy because when we hear what organisms are in domain eukarya, we think it's insanely diverse because it's us, it's humans, it's all the animals, insects, it's all the plants, all the fungi, protists, but it, in terms of their DNA, it's actually a very small fraction of the overall diversity of life. Most of that diversity is captured within the microbial world. Single-celled archaea were originally classified with bacteria, but now have a branch of their own. Bacteria and archaea are different. They're branches of life that separated many, many billions of years ago. But then when we started to uh, get molecular information, genomic or genetic information, sequencing genes and comparing genes, we started to realize that bacteria and archaea are incredibly different from one another. Their genes are very dissimilar in many cases. This investigation requires extensive time in the field and in the lab. Oh, cool. In TBI, we're working on a couple of different uh, aspects of thermophiles. One is very fundamental. So we're taking samples from the hot springs and we've got groups of organisms that no one's ever grown in a laboratory and um, nobody knows how to grow them. We find them very common in the hot springs and, and can't figure out how to reproduce that in, in the lab. And so we're doing everything we can to learn about those microorganisms. If we can grow organisms in the lab, we can understand so much about what they're doing. And you can formulate hypotheses based on what you see in the hot spring and then test those in a tube in the lab. I take a sample from a hot spring and I extract all the DNA of all the genomes of all the organisms, all the microorganisms in that hot spring sample. And then I sequence that DNA and then the next step is the computer analysis of trying to understand uh, how to take all of that genomic information and, and isolate different individual microbes. And then there are the strange viruses found in the streaming geysers and pools. You have thermophilic bacteria, you also have thermophilic archaea that both live in these hot springs, and then you have the viruses that infect both the archaea and the bacteria that live in the hot springs. Like bacteria, the word virus often conjures up images of sickness and death. But none of the heat-loving viruses in Yellowstone affect our health, because our bodies are too cold. So the viruses in the springs are dependent on those specific bacteria or archaea, so they, they don't infect humans. 
all have evolved from the earliest forms of life on embryonic Earth. And together, they suggest that life may have arisen in super hot environments. How did life originate here on Earth? And what was the evolutionary history of life? How did life colonize certain environments that are very extreme or distinct from other environments? Some archaea, bacteria, and viruses in extreme environments still live in the same way as our earliest microbial ancestors and use the same sources of energy. We oftentimes find organisms, microbes, with, with early evolved or, or deep evolutionary roots. In other words, they branch off at a very, very early point on the tree of life. And so these are the types of organisms that are likely, they're, they're not the same as what was existing four billion years ago, but they're maybe more similar to that than anything else. And so we, if we understand their sort of modern day cousins of those ancient organisms, we can understand more about those ancient organisms. A new virus found in Yellowstone's thermal pools by Rebecca Hoshtein and Martin Lawrence has a structure so ancient that scientists think it may be connected to the root of the universal tree of life. According to a new study published by the National Academy of Sciences, it affects only archaea and it's spindle-shaped. It seems to be part of a rare superfamily. Every time we go and sample, we find DNA from organisms that nobody's ever grown, nobody's ever named. And so just the diversity of unknown organisms out there is, to me, the most exciting. This is actually like a very active area of research. And as new genomic information comes in on different organisms, we, we are able to sequence new genomes and we're able to get new sequences to compare and to place on the tree of life new branches start to arise. We start to actually discover new branches of life that we didn't know about before. The possibilities have experts in many fields excited. The main goal of, of my research is to understand what organisms are in these hot springs, but also as an engineer, what can we do with these? How can they benefit society? How can we use them to do any sort of biotechnological task that we, we set at, at hand. As they investigate the ways that life likely evolved, they're inching closer to finding new places where life might be found. So as we start to gather data about the chemistry of Mars or the chemistry of Titan or Enceladus or Europa, all of these exoplanets in our own solar system that are interesting places where life may have at least at one point colonized, then we can understand a lot about those environments by studying environments on Earth that are sort of exotic and interesting. Yellowstone's thermal pools may hold the keys to the origin of life on our planet and beyond. There is so much we don't know and that we're still learning constantly. Perhaps one day soon, Yellowstone's thermophiles will reveal the answers to one of the most burning questions in science. Are we alone in the universe? I have no evidence to say that we are not alone. I have not discovered alien life, but I think it is incredibly probable that we are not alone.